Good evening and welcome to the County Council District 5 Candidate Forum. I am Rachel Evans, Chair of the Board of the Friends of White Oak. Friends of White Oak is a nonprofit community organization dedicated to improving the White Oak area through community outreach and working with lo local leaders. Thank you candidates for joining and we wish you the best of luck in this primary. Your moderator tonight is JJ Green, National Security Correspondent for WTOP Radio for 18 years. Thank you, JJ, for moderating, and I will pass this on to you now. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you, uh, Friends of White Oak. Hello, candidates. As you've heard, my name's JJ Green. I'm your moderator tonight. And as a resident of District 5, um, I'm actively engaged in helping or trying to help improve the area and finding solutions to what we residents need most. I'm happy to be here and excited to learn more about the candidates here. This forum is going to consist of five questions about economic development, public safety, equitable services, and other issues that are important to residents. Each of you will have 90 seconds to deliver your answers. Please answer the questions that you are asked. And I hope I won't have to do this, but if you go over, I might have to interrupt you, but there will be a timer that will tell you when you've reached time. So please note that timer. Um, I would like to introduce each of you. Brian Anlu, Democrat. Fatma Bar Barry, Democrat. Christopher Bolton, Democrat. Daniel Kuroma, Democrat. Carrie Lamare, Democrat. Kristen Mink, Democrat. William Montier, Democrat. Jeremiah Polk, Democrat. And Kate Woody, Republican. Ooh. So we'll start first, our first question to Brian Anlu. That question is, how do you plan to increase business and economic development in this district. You have 90 seconds, Mr. Anlu, to answer. Yeah, thank you for having me and uh, thank you for organizing this forum. Uh, so I think the biggest thing we need to do to uh, spur economic development in the East County is continue to double down on uh, biotech um, and realize the potential of the uh, envisioned Viva White Oak development. Um, and that begins uh, in part with streamlining the permitting process. The council has already taken taken a number of steps to um, streamline the planning approval process for those projects, narrowing down the time that it takes for those projects to uh, get through planning from roughly 18 months to as little as six months. Um, I think that's all well and good, but it uh, doesn't help anyone, particularly these biotech companies that need speed to market um, if uh, you know they have to spend another year in the Department of Permitting Services. So I think it begins with a culture of yes with our inspectors and our, our uh, permitting team, uh, making sure that they understand and uh, know what they're reviewing when they approve some of these uh, projects. United Therapeutics is an example of that. For uh, It's not in East County, but it's in downtown Silver Spring and a lot of the cutting edge stuff that they're doing there. I know um, some of the permitting inspectors had a difficult time with because they had never seen that kind of uh, that kind of development and activity before. So I think it begins with doubling down on uh, on um, biotech and, and realizing the potential for, for Viva White Oak. Uh, with that, I think there's also a number of challenges with getting that project off the ground, uh, particularly water and sewer uh, infrastructure. Uh, related to the development itself. And so um, looking for creative ways to finance that project. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Fat Fatmata Berry, you have 90 seconds. The question is, how do you plan to increase business and economic development in this district? You have 90 seconds. Um, thank you. Well, we know that small businesses are over 80% of, of our businesses here in Montgomery County. And what that means is making sure that we put resources in place that make it easier for small businesses to come into the county, but also remain in the county and prosper, which means um, um, streamlining the process of filing, the process of um, having your licensure, making sure that they have access to information for funding purposes that are not just limited to big businesses, that are not just limited to huge corporations, because the small businesses, they hire locally and they hire hyper-locally, which means that we have people um, living in a district who then put the money back into the district because they live here. So you bring in jobs, you bring in training, livable wage to our residents and resources for these small businesses that I talk about. And making sure that at the end of the day, 
when you when you say you want to bring economic development, you also add the, infra, the transportation infrastructure to make sure that the folks who live here in the five access to have access to proper transportation to get to where they need to get to within 15 or 30 minutes and making sure that we have um, not just build where we have transit, but, but build transit where we live on this eastern part of the county and ensure that um, people can take care of their houses, their homes, their children, provide all that to build our economy here in the East County. Mary, thank you. Next participant, um, how do you plan to increase business and economic development in this district? Mr. Christopher Bolton, you have 90 seconds. Thank you for the question. Um, I think the first thing we have to do to spur economic development is show that the area is actually ready for the economic development. Um, the infrastructure piece, the roads, the transit, um, all of these things will probably outlive whoever is elected. Um, we're talking eight to 10 years of problems that um, have been brewing for about 30 years. Um, I know it's not the current subject, but also public safety takes into account our economic development. Because in an area where you have a rising crime rate, businesses look at that. Businesses look at the crime rate, the livability, the schools. They're not just gonna build something and put their employees into any area that they can. So we have a plethora of issues that need to be resolved before we can start really building up. Um, also, we need to spur up the, the increasing cost of rent. The increasing cost of rent will affect the type of workers that come to East County um, and that live in East County. I know that small business is a big part of it. And if small business can't pay a living wage, then East County is kind of off the beaten path of the main area. So we kind of need to fix up the housing, the rental, um, the rising rental costs and everything. Mr. Bolton, thank you. Daniel Karoma, how do you plan to increase business and economic development in this district? You have 90 seconds. Well, thank you, JJ. And that's a very important question. In fact, the next council coming uh, into, um, you know, in, into play will have to focus specifically on this question that you just asked. I would also like to ask, um, thank the Friends of White Oak for putting this together and all the organization. Uh, there are three things businesses um, that I talk to tell me why and how, why they want to come to Montgomery County. So first of all, the county um, making sure that we're partnering with them. And as I said, the planning department has been an issue, a major issue when it comes to development in the east part of the county, especially when it comes to prioritizing you know, development in the east county. Right? So it's good that, again, there's some changes that are taking place there. So that's one. When that happens, so Bottonsville Crossing, for example, is a great place for economic development. We bring in incentives. We bring in not only large businesses, medium-sized businesses, but what I call garden economics. We create the environment, the ecosystem, so that businesses can start and grow here in the county. Then we come to White Oak, 280 acres that the county government has put in place for that development. We go to Hillendale Gateway. So these three areas are important areas, you know, when it comes to economic development here in Montgomery County. But housing is also a big issue as well, including transportation. So those are the three elements that businesses say will make them move into not only the county, but into the East County. As the, the current business liaison officer, I'm looking forward to working with any, any of these businesses as a council member. Thank you. I think we lost the moderator. We lost the audio for uh, Mr. Green. Okay, let's try that again. Daniel, <laughs> thank you very much. How do you, Carrie Lamari, plan to increase business and economic development in this district? You have 90 seconds. Uh, it's imperative. Uh, we're in dire straits in this county right now. For the past 10 years, 
our residential growth rate has increased 0.66% per year. Our economic growth rate, our jobs, has only increased 0.24%. That's extremely disproportionate. Now, White Oak, Viva White Oak is probably going to be the catalyst for economic growth, not only for the East County, but for the entire Montgomery County. What we have to do is get the get our state delegation, get the federal government involved and uh, create an incentive package with tax abatements, um, you know, uh, with uh, uh, all sorts of proposals, even if it requires uh, um, money towards the actual construction for a couple of the the. Uh, the developers, we need at least three anchors. If we can get those three anchors, we can provide jobs for the residents of the East County. We also need to create educational opportunities, vocational opportunities, because the reality is any large successful organization is gonna look at our population and want to have the, an employment base that they can rely on, that they can feed, feed from. Um, once we have our large, uh, large anchors, Small business, you know, that'll, that'll provide incentive, uh, jobs and small businesses will feed off of that. We will grow and we will build a continuum of economic growth from Burtonsville all the way to White Oak and then beyond to Silver Spring. And we need to extend beyond life. Thank you very much. Mr. Lamari, thank you very much. Kristen, Kristen Mink, how do you plan to increase business and economic development in this district? You have 90 seconds. Thank you. Yeah, we absolutely need to streamline the process of starting a business here for both small and large businesses. Um, we need them to have a concierge-like experience when they come in, where they have a point of contact uh, with the county, someone who will help them through the process. Um, and we need to ensure that they're not hitting redundancies, which um, I'm hearing from many business owners has been a regular part of the process for quite some time. Um, and we, I believe that we can absolutely do that without making inordinate concessions to uh, businesses and developers. It has to benefit the community first and foremost. This also, frankly, has to do with priorities. These promises have been made around, you know, Viva White Oak, Burtonsville Crossing, and so on for years upon years. We need people on the county council who are going to be making it a huge priority to get these things done and who are not going to find it acceptable to delay year after year. Um, who are going to make sure that we're bringing stakeholders to the table to get this done. I'll give you a quick example, then advocating with the community around Burtonsville Crossing, among other things. We just got recently got word from Senator Zucker and the rest of the state delegation that they secured $5 million um, for Burtonsville Crossing, and that includes for costs associated with extinguishing a lease requirement there at Burtonsville Crossing. So when we need to put pressure on the state to get funding like that to get things done, that's what we have to do. And then we also need academic pipelines for our students to make sure that our local kids are able to take advantage of the job opportunities that we are bringing in for them. So that's scholarships, that's internships, and so on. Ms. Mink, thank you. William Montier, the question is, how do you plan to increase business and economic development in this district? You have 90 seconds. You're muted, Chip. Thank you. Let's try that again. <laughs> uh, making, making jobs grow, making our economic development growth. Our population is growing. We need to match and create high paying jobs to match our uh, economic, our population growth. Uh, we need to modify our tax structure to make it more business friendly. We need to at, examine our business regulations and make them not only protective for consumers, but also fertile for our businesses. So those are things that we can do to attract businesses. We have to change the perception that Montgomery County is too slow in our permitting or too expensive in our taxes uh, for businesses to come here and succeed. And then once they're here, uh, we need to partner some small businesses with um, executive offices from larger, more successful companies in a mentoring program to help ensure their success. Um, and as, as, as was said earlier, we absolutely to need to make uh, funds more available to small businesses so they can expand and hire workers and just uh, make it through the first several years. Uh, that's a huge opportunity. Small businesses employ over 50% of our, of our people. Uh, and that's a huge thing that will cause the county to prosper in every area. 
Mr. Montier, thank you very much. Jeremiah Pope, how do you plan to increase business and economic development in this district? You have 90 seconds. Yes, uh, thank you, JJ and the Friends of White Oak for hosting uh, this evening uh, forum. Uh, to me, I think it's about um, being realistic on how we grow business in this part of the county. Uh, one, uh, we have to change the um, perception of how people uh, view Montgomery County as a whole. Uh, we, uh, you know, most people believe that uh, Montgomery County is not open for business, um, dealing with our high taxes, dealing with uh, some of our schools in the eastern part of the county, uh, not being as top tier as other parts of the county. Uh, so I believe that uh, we need to provide certain incentives, uh, not giving a, the whole cow away, but uh, providing enough incentives to make people come into the county. Uh, we can do it by um, supporting our small and women and minority owned businesses, helping them grow and, and be stabilized and be successful. Uh, so I see it as a two, uh, two prong approach. Um, yes, we have the uh, Hillendale Gateway Plan, uh, which I live in Hillendale and been living there for the last 15 years. And I've seen how long uh, that has taken to uh, develop. Um, it's, 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 it's there, but it's, it's a long way coming. Uh, but when we're talking about White Oak in general, I mean, this is this perception of um, crime in that part of the area. So we do need to uh, figure out how to um, tap down on that crime. Uh, we need to, um, um, like I said, uh, incentivize people to come in this area and make sure that our communities are safe, our communities are walkable, and people want to be here. I, I believe that uh, we do have the FDA and, I, and as Brian said, uh, we, we do have the uh, biotech corridor. Uh, thank you. Mr. Pope, thank you. Kate Woody, how do you plan to increase business and economic development in this district? You have 90 seconds. I would uh, use the assets that we have on hand right now to make access to the $195 million that Hogan has delegated for businesses in Montgomery County. 45 million of that is for underprivileged areas or entrepreneurs. Right now we have a, an anchor which is called NASA. We can have, we have many space scientists or, or other engineers that can go into NASA or make small companies that will work with NASA. It's only a few miles away. It's very close and it's available right now. With respect to White Oak and the uh, Burtonsville area, Sears is empty now. I would make kiosks open and I would give some kind of seed money for small micro businesses to get started, loans to people who have no business experience at all, but can make their first experience something that is maybe tutored a little bit or mentored or have training from uh, the food code people so that we can uh, pull the money and get some refrigerators for food and areas for planting food outside in a greenhouse right outside of uh, Sears. That, so too that could happen with 198 where the old giant used to be. Also, I would give insurance for personal service professionals. Thank you very much, Ms. Woody. So that is it for round one of the questions. We move into the second round of questions and I'm going to go out on a limb in this era of Zoom and guarantee you that your moderator is going to make sure that you can hear me at all times as I ask these questions. And um, we will start with this question in Brian and Lou. How will you work with local businesses and incentivize entrepreneurship in this region? You have 90 seconds. Yeah, you know, I think a lot of the things that uh, some of my um, opponents talked about uh, already exist here in the county today. Um, White Oak is already an opportunity zone. It's federally designated. Uh, Burnsville is a state uh, designated enterprise zone, uh, meaning that those uh, both of those locations are today some of the best places to start businesses in the East County from a, a capital perspective and an investment perspective. So, um, you know, clearly that's not enough. Um, you know, as I sort of alluded to this in my first response, um, I think what we need to is getting to a culture of yes, uh, whether it's, um, you know, our business department uh, and folks that are in charge of working with incentives uh, or whether it's our, um, you know, the Montgomery County Economic Development Corporation. Uh, I think that uh, that organization is too focused on landing the big fish. 
uh, like Amazon, if you will, um, and hasn't been you know, paying enough attention to small uh, and medium-sized businesses um, and offering them the uh, support with navigating county government, uh, navigating the various incentives and structures that already exist today uh, to support those businesses and, and support entrepreneurship. So again, I think it's about getting to a culture of yes and, and getting our uh, existing departments, agencies, personnel to refocus uh, from you know landing a uh, big corporation to helping our small and medium-sized businesses to grow. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Anlu. Fatmata Berry. How will you work with local businesses and incentivize entrepreneurship in this region? You have 90 seconds. Thank you. Um, so we know that small businesses hyper, um, hire hyper locally, right? So what, what I know and believe can work is utilizing this apprenticeship idea, right? Where you have um, people, young folks, who maybe come out of hopefully very soon, East County um, campus of MC, where they transition into a small business that's here in the East County. And they're, uh, 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 they're being taught the business. And at the end of the day, by the time they leave, they've learned the business that they're interested in and they can build their own business, providing the resources and information that they need, providing the seed money that they need to be entrepreneurs, providing the training that they need to be entrepreneurs. Yes, we have services in this county, that's no doubt, but the problem has always been the lack of resources that are available to the people who live in this county, in this part of the county. So it's not that we don't have it, it's making it available for those of us who live here. Um, and this is where equity and inclusion comes in, is what I'm running on, which is to ensure that there's an equitable distribution of information, equitable distribution of resources, and ensuring that everyone has the same access to the funding, everyone has the same access to the entrepreneurship, everyone has the same access to, make, um, to learning the process to build a business and stay in business. Thank you, Ms. Barry. Christopher Bolton, how will you work with local businesses and incentivize entrepreneurship in this region? You have 90 seconds. Thank you. Um, the first thing we need to do is if we're gonna incentivize local businesses or incentivize entrepreneurship, we need to start in high school. Um, we need to start teaching our kids how to balance a checkbook. Um, they need to start learning basic adulthood finances as most kids, once they leave high school, they have about six to eight months before they become a legal adult. And those skills of teaching them how to balance checkbook, basic financial skills will also help them um, open a business and keep it open. As we all know that most businesses fail within the first year, and that's because of either poor financing or over-promising and under-delivering. So if we teach our kids, if we teach our younger adults who have probably great ideas that fit the needs of the area, um, I think that that would help step one. Um, for existing businesses, I think the days of $15 an hour, even though that's the minimum wage, it's not a livable wage anymore. So we need to work with the county, the state, the federal government. We need to start putting more money into these opportunity zones to help raise pay. We need to start teaching people the more advanced skills of their job, more vocation, so that way people can kind of tear themselves up. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bolton. Daniel Karoma. How will you work with local businesses and incentivize entrepreneurship in this region? You have 90 seconds. JJ, thank you. As I said earlier, again, working with businesses is the number one imperative anyone right now that is running for office has. And that's what I've done. Um, I'm currently the county's uh, business liaison officer. And during the pandemic, I worked with over 14,000 businesses providing um, the grant, um, not only uh, local grant, state grant, but federal grant for them um, to survive. And many of these businesses that I worked, to, uh, worked with are, are minority, female, veteran, and disabled owned businesses. Let me give an example. Um, Aisha, who is currently at Leisure World Plaza, it was in the pandemic. She used to make soap in her kitchen sink. She got a, a micro grant from the county 
and use that money to order uh, inventory. And all of a sudden, the hand sanitizer uh, market dried up during the pandemic. And she became one of the contractors that the Economic Development Corporation worked with. And guess what? She now occupy a 15,000 square foot space at Leisure World Plaza. I met with three brothers, uh, the Muchasara brothers. Uh, they came here to Montgomery County, started uh, Truebill. And now they were just bought for 1.3 billion. That's the experience that I bring to this race. That's, those are the revenues we need to sustain our $6.3 billion budget. What we need to do, again, is sit down with businesses, bring, 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 bring in terms of a comprehensive uh, strategy into play. We have the plans. Economic Development Corporation is have a plan, but we need to just put the strategies into play. And that's what I would do as a council member. Thank you, Mr. Terry Lamari, how will you work with local businesses and incentivize entrepreneurship in this region? You have 90 seconds. As a council person, I think that the primary job that we have is constituent service. To do that, we need to communicate with our constituents. We need to educate them on what is available. As uh, Daniel said, there are economic grants available at the county. Um, I know because Burtonsville is, a, is an opportunity zone uh, or an, an enterprise zone, there are low interest loans there that are, that are, that are available for business people. There are, there are grants that are even available. Housing Economic Development has monies uh, for improvement of, of facilities for these entrepreneurs. And like, like I alluded to earlier, it all starts with doing your job properly. So how do you do that? Vocational training. We need to create a vocational training center for the East County so that we have the workforce for tomorrow. If we have the workforce tomorrow for tomorrow, we also have the entrepreneurship for tomorrow. All we need to do is provide them the guidance on how to start the, their business and the economic resources to bring it to fruition. That would be my job. As a, as a council member, I would, I would steward them into a, a new lifelong enterprise of, of being, pro, you know, of making money. I've actually been in business since 1979. I think the opportunities are there. We just got to make them available to the public. Thank you very much. That's it. Thank you, Mr. Lamari. Thank you. Kristen Mink, how will you work with local businesses and incentivize entrepreneurship in this region? You have 90 seconds. Yeah, I believe that locals, residents who are looking to start businesses, they need to have a single point of contact within the county. A person who is like a caseworker who is going, whose goal is to help them achieve what they need to achieve. That means when they have questions about licenses and permits and so on, um, that they have the same person who they can go back to and ask those questions to. Because what I hear over and over and over again is that they, is that these folks end up running in circles. They talk to all these different people. They have to re-explain the problems that they're having. Some people are more helpful than others. And um, it, would, it sounds like it would be tremendously helpful if there can be a single point of contact for each of these folks. And I think that's especially a priority when we have a local resident who is looking to start a small business here. I think that we should also plug this into both our educational system, our high schoolers and our college students, um, and as well as our unemployment system. I've talked to several people who have been on unemployment here and who really wish that the county did more to help actually uh, match them with jobs and help them to find opportunities. So I see a, see a real opportunity here um, for a partnership that could be built between folks who are looking to start businesses and folks who are looking for employment. I'd also like to see, um, we have this uh, minority female disabled owned business program as well as the um, veteran owned business program. I'd like to see LGBTQ plus folks added um, to that designation um, and, uh, and, and assist folks who are not demographic as well. Thank you, Ms. Mink. William Montier, how will you work with local businesses and incentivize entrepreneurship in this region? You have 90 seconds. Thank you. Well, we have to overcome a long held perception um, that our county is not the best place to do business. Um, and so I believe we need a long term campaign to make the case to businesses here and businesses not in this area that we are the place. We, our legislators and leaders have the right attitude. We want you here. We have an attitude of yes. 
Um, we have the friendly uh, tax structure. We have infrastructure. We have small business loans. Uh, we have mentoring programs uh, where you can be, you can come plant your business. Even on the real estate side, there must be the appropriate um, industrial real estate infrastructure for these businesses to come and plant their headquarters that will welcome you and allow you to prosper here and flourish for many, many decades. And so that's what I would do. I'd reach out and make that case and court those businesses. And um, having done this before, uh, running a nonprofit, we had to get a lot of donations from small businesses. So I know how to partner with small businesses uh, to get things done. Um, so that's something I would do here as well as elsewhere. Um, visit all the chambers of commerce, um, not just in Montgomery County, but regionally as well. Because it would have to be a regional strategy to really change and overhaul um, the climate here and create a whole new fertile business community in Montgomery County. And that's what I would be committed to doing. Thank you, Mr. Montier. Jeremiah Pope. Uh, uh, yes. <clears throat> local businesses and incentivize entrepreneurship in this region. You have 90 seconds. Well, um, you know, as we alluded to earlier, um, I think a lot of this is making sure you have incentives in place uh, like, you know, micro loans, uh, making sure we partner with our labor partners, um, our labor community. Um, I'm also partnering with people who have uh, started successful businesses in the eastern part of the county. Uh, I think a lot of times that um, we have the idea of um, uh, uh, running a business or starting a business, but we don't have that person um, to help um, us be successful. So I think the, um, the county uh, has the resources, but we need to make sure that those resources are equitable in place. I know I hear um, African Americans, um, uh, constituents, you know, saying that they're not getting their fair share. And if you look at the data, um, it, it shows that uh, they're not getting their fair share. And so I think uh, we need to make sure that community um, is as it has a, a focus point uh, because you know we you know we are in the eastern part of the county, and we want to make sure that um, the people in uh, the eastern part of the county, the White Oak area, are able to be successful. Um, so we can talk about all these projects, but I want to make sure those projects um, that the money and, and, and the incentives uh, help the people who actually live in the community. So I'll do my part as a small business owner myself. I get it. I understand. And, and I want to make sure, like I said, the things are, are in place uh, that we can all partner with labor, with the labor community. Uh, we can partner with small and minority business owners, women, um, businesses, and making sure they have the things in order to be successful. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Polk. Kate Woody, how will you work with local businesses and incentivize entrepreneurship in this region? You have 90 seconds. Well, for small businesses, I would set up tax incentives and uh, reduce the regulations. I would also reduce the gas tax in Montgomery County from the 43 cents that's being going to be charged as of July 1 this year. I would, for the housing, I would refurbish a great deal of the housing, particularly in Langley Park, which is about 75 to 100 percent brick and mortar. And so you can gut the house and keep the structure up and, and at a very minimal price and use that almost immediately. I would also ask for local firms to be providing the support services for the new business so that you have new business in the form of local firms. So you have both of those who are learning and those who are teaching how to go about opening up a business. Also, I would ask for offices for micro loans to be set up in Montgomery County and particularly the East County. So it's open for business and people can come in and it's local. They don't have to go to Rockville. They can go walk or take the bus to a office that's right here in the area. And those are the, my major thoughts on that. And the grants should be low interest, but because this is a form of seed money, but everybody should pay a little something. It makes it more valuable to them, in my opinion. Thank you, Ms. Woody. Well, we made it through two rounds. Yeah. This is a big group. You guys are great looking. You all sound smart and I'm really happy to hear what you have to say. We're gonna move on into the third round of questions right now. We'll start again with Brian and Lou. And the question is, what public safety measures are the most vital 
that have been vocalized by constituents and how will you enforce them? You have 90 seconds. Yeah, this is a great question. Um, you know, we're currently dealing with the public safety crisis in the county. Um, you know, some people uh, might say that we have, um, you know, crime across the board, but it's not just, um, you know, petty crime, you know, carjackings and uh, burglaries that we're seeing. You know, we've seen the homicide rate go up. Um, you know, personally, I think one, one homicide is too many. Um, so, you know, firstly, I think, um, you know, we need to uh, address the morale issues that we have in our police department. And uh, I think that begins with fill, filling the vacancies. The third district uh, police station has been understaffed for, uh, you know, a very long time, going back to when I was on uh, council staff and, uh, and it had the most vacancies of any of the police districts, uh, despite being one of the highest needs and highest call for service uh, districts um, in the county. Um, so I think it begins with, uh, you know, addressing our recruitment and retention uh, challenges that we have in the county. Um, I'm not, I, I, uh, I want to raise the um, uh, starting officer pay, which is currently among the lowest uh, in the region, uh, to match the highest paying jurisdictions if needed so we can address the best cops uh, or address the best candidates. Um, and beyond that, I think we need to have uh, mental health services, a comprehensive um, crisis intervention and de-escalation training uh, for our officers uh, and people to respond to people who are in crisis um, uh, all over the county. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Anlu. Fatmata Berry, what public safety measures are the most vital that have been vocalized by constituents and how will you enforce them? You have 90 seconds. All right, so um, I worked on the county council before running for office and my portfolio was public safety. And part of what I heard a lot of in working in the community was the fact that there were underlying issues pertaining to many of what we see happening. And yes, definitely, we all want to feel safe. I certainly do. I wanna be able to walk around my community and my neighborhood and not worry about somebody coming up to me, jacking me up or whatever it is. Um, but this is the fact. Many times we find that there are circumstances that lead to a lot of these behaviors. And we find that even with officers themselves, they have issues themselves that, that impact them as human beings. So what I've said in the past and will continue to say is this, we need mental health services. We need um, programs like the like Cahoots to go along with the police to, um, to some of these calls, which we've come to find out many of which, many of which were uh, um, not necessarily needing police officers with guns providing resources for community members, whether it is jobs, whether it's providing them um, proper paid jobs, living in a community that they feel matters and cares for them, ensuring that the police officers themselves receive the mental health resources that they need and ensuring that we have community policing, maybe getting police officers to go to programs here in the county and um, in the East County with MC. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Barry. Christopher Bolton. What public safety measures are the most vital that have been vocalized by constituents and how will you enforce them? You have 90 seconds. So currently, um, I think there's a conflict in the middle between what the community wants and what the police department wants. So a lot of the community that I've talked to, they feel that officers unnecessarily stop them and that's to be debated the officers feel like the council doesn't support them. So the first thing we need to do is get our officers back on board and make them feel supported because they don't wanna work in a county where they feel like the legislation on hand currently is gonna get them killed. So they're going to other jurisdictions. We're losing officers at a high clip. Howard County just put out a commercial the other day that if you've been a police officer for five years, come over there and you can have $63,000, which is way more than what Montgomery County pays. And that's starting pay. So we need to work on the pay for officers. We need to work on the morale for officers. And then we need to work on the, the ghost gun issue. Um, I know that's federal. Um, I know there's a law on the books in the county currently, but the federal government, the ATF needs to micro stamp 3D printers so that way everything that's printed just like a regular printer has micro stamps on it so that way at least if you catch a ghost gun you can get a lead on where it came from. Um, the other issues are societal. 
Um, nobody wants to back down and everybody has a gun. So you step on somebody's shoe and they're going to kill you. So those are the issues that we need to help merge and kind of tamp down the societal uh, kerfuffle. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bolton. Daniel Coroma, what public safety measures are the most vital that have been vocalized by constituents and how will you enforce them? You have 90 seconds. And again, thank you, JJ, for that important question. Um, again, we've knocked on over 7,000 doors here in the East County. Uh, and prior to that, when I started the uh, Gilchrist Immigrant Resource Center, I knocked on probably a few hundred doors. That, that was in 2008 uh, in the Brick Cheney area. Community policing has always been the number one issue that our community say, listen, we don't know too much about our officers. We don't even know our officers. Let me give you a quick example. When the third district was located in White Oak, right next to my house, I actually offered at that time, Commander Jones to bring our neighbors. I went to the Oak Hill apartment because I used to live there and I will take tours, bring people into the third district um, um, office so that they could see it's not a jail. It was just a police office, uh, headquarter, right? So I worked with Commander Jones at that time before he becomes Chief Jones to set up the first White Oak Community Policing Advisory Board right at the rec center. That's what I've done. And I've worked with every chief of police going back. I've worked with many of the commanders in the executive branch. But let's face the fact, there are candidates running in this race who say police should be out of everything, including DUI traffic stops. I think that is irresponsible. As a council member, I would work with our police officers. The pay will go up. But besides that, I'll make sure that the morale comes back because they would know that as a council member, I have their back. I've worked with many of them for over 15 years in the executive branch. Mr. Karoma, thank you very much. Carrie Lamari, what public safety measures are the most vital that have been vocalized by constituents and how will you enforce them? You have 90 seconds. I can only add to what Brian Anley said and what Christopher Bolton said. The fact of the matter is we've had an 88% rise in our homicide rate, 72% rise in our carjacking rate, 28% rise in our car theft rate. Uh, there's been a significant uh, issue with respect to how a lot of the people in this county view police today. That has to change. Um, we need to rebuild the confidence, the trust in our police department. We need to create engagement between police and, uh, and the public. Uh, today, they had a public hearing um, and, and, and there was a big argument on a, a $700,000 uh, allotment that, uh, that, that we were getting from the federal government because of pandemic relief for the police. And that was just to provide youth services uh, like midnight basketball and, 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 and of course some data gathering. The reality is we need to leave the, the, the law enforcement to the professionals. We need to include mental health services in the, the new paradigm of, 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 of uh, uh, public safety. And we need to start supporting our police. The day, the day that people start to criticize, if you're going to criticize, come up with a solution. I'm willing to listen to you. But until then, I want to work with Chief Jones. He's, he's got in great initiatives like the Multi-Stakeholder Task Force and many others that he's working on to try to include the community. Thank you. Mr. Lamari, thank you very much. Kristen. No what public safety measures are the most vital that have been vocalized by constituents and how will you enforce them? You have 90 seconds. Yeah, just... what, I'm hearing, what I'm hearing from folks is that um, if you know, police officers want our, want our trust, we will all function better if they have our trust. Um, we need to build a system that will allow them to earn it from the community. So we need to build out our response options for example, when there is a nonviolent mental health incident, that should be responded to by mental health experts. Um, right now, we have a very small handful of crisis response teams. The great majority of mental health calls are still responded to by police officers. Um, the crisis response teams are, are uh, respond to calls with the police officer. So it also doesn't free up those officers' time. Um, so if we are, have more response options, this will allow us to use our police officers in a more thoughtful way. They should be focused on violent crime and on closing cases. 
We also need to invest more in preventing crime. That means mental health care, affordable housing, education, job training, improved connection between folks who are unemployed and job opportunities, um, and then gun control. I'm hearing about that all the time. And absolutely, there are things that we can do here um, to improve gun control in our area. We should be sending annual letters home to MCPS parents detailing Maryland's mandatory safe gun storage practices. Um, Moms Demand Action has been requesting that of MCPS for quite some time. Um, we should prohibit domestic abusers under temp temporary restraining orders from having firearms. And we should provide facilities where gun owners can temporarily store their <coughs> firearms if they're Thank you, Ms. Mink. William Montier. What public safety measures are the most vital that have been vocalized by constituents and how will you enforce them? You have 90 seconds. Well, first of all, uh, one of the things we cannot do is think that gun control is a federal issue. Um, we must pass some responsible gun control legislation here at the county level and then hopefully continue to push it so it goes up to state and federal level. But my most important issue here in safety for our community is um, a partnership, partnership between police and community. We can't be naive to think that there's not a historical history between uh, communities of color and police that created distrust. However, I believe that if we focus on um, building that relationship, we can have mutual trust on both sides. I live here in East County and um, before the pandemic, uh, the police over here um, at East County Rec Center, um, they would have every summer and many of the holidays, um, fa uh, fairs and events where the community could come in and they could relate and just be together. And so I think that's a huge step forward. So basically we need to require our police officers to undergo crisis intervention training and prioritize community response model that involves, as was said earlier, mental health professionals, social workers and community members. Um, you know, and a way to approach uh, improving morale is to provide police with all the resources they need. Now, as we know, there is a shortage of police officers. So we need to A, fill in the police officers and then provide them with the adequate uh, resources they need um, and so forth. Mr. Pope, uh, sorry, uh, Mr. Montier, thank you very much. Um, Jeremiah Pope is next. What public safety measures are the most vital that have been vocalized by constituents and how will you enforce them? You have 90 seconds. Yes, I think the, um, you know, the, uh, some of the most important things is, it depends on the part of the community that you're in. Uh, you know, if you go to uh, certain sections of uh, the East County, you, you have people who say they, they, uh, they're very happy. They don't have um, a lot of uh, issues with over-policing or, uh, car thefts or or any of those type of things. But then if you go up into uh, the White Oak uh, Lockwood Drive area, um, you have more issues uh, with, you know, people stealing. At one time, people was shooting and, and all kind of other things. And so um, I say those things because, um, you know, each part of the county, everybody has a different viewpoint. And in certain sections, people want more police, others they don't. Um, so I feel like a lot of this is about ensuring that we do have enough police officers uh, when you do call that they are responsive. Um, we need to also make sure we have the incentives in place where the officers actually know the residents and know the people they um, serve, um, able to be able to live in the community. So making sure we have housing that's affordable for them to be able to live here. Um, also, I think we need to uh, really look at um, making sure we have police officers in our schools um, and only dealing with nonviolent crimes. I mean, dealing with violent crimes. And that's been one of the biggest issues that people have been talking to me about is that they want to make sure they have officers in place to be able to respond at need. Mr. Pope, thank you very much. Kate Woody, what public safety measures are the most vital that have been vocalized by constituents and how will you enforce them? You have 90 seconds. I would put uh, school resource officers in each school and look for officers who have a heart for children because that makes a huge difference. My husband's a teacher and the school resource officers over the years have de-escalated many 
a problem before it became violent. And it also, if there had been resource officers in the elementary school in Texas, there wouldn't have been 19 children and two adults who would have been killed because there would have been at least one person there. I would put back the auto theft unit. I would make uh, the cop on the beat and living in the community and so that they know what the community is like and they can sense what something is not right. To do that, you would raise the salary to parity with other jurisdictions. You would have let the patrol cars be in communities during the weekend on nights. For housing in the community, you would have vouchers or other tax incentives for them. I would suggest that we have training and study and case studies. My son is autistic and eloped when he was young. He was a case study of the gazelle of Silver Spring. And uh, so that they had a better understanding of what autism was when they were confronted by it. I would work with you, youth. I would have open houses where there would be training in gun management, training in the responsible use of it. That's it. Thank right. you. Ms. Woody, thank you. Thank you for that uh, round of questions, everybody. Uh, moving on to our fourth question. Um, starting with you again, Brian and Luke. What agencies and organizations will you work with on issues like the lack of safe transportation and housing equity? You have 90 seconds. Yeah, it's something I've already been working a lot on um, in terms of trying to fix 198, uh, trying to fix the 29 corridor, uh, both from as a public servant um, at the Park and Planning Commission um, and before that, during my time as an aide to Council Member Hucker, um, but also as a community member. Um, I co-founded the Coalition to Fix 198 to uh, get traffic safety improvements along the uh, dangerous 11 mile stretch of highway between Georgia Avenue and 95. Uh, and 1.198 was actually averaging uh, a car crash every uh, four days, believe it or not. And uh, you know we got some interventions with the State Highway Administration that helped make it a little bit safer. Um, and fortunately, you know, those accidents have been reduced. But there's uh, a number of long-term, uh, both uh, pedestrian, bicyclists, and uh, safety improvements that need to be made uh, all over the district and countywide, um, beginning with the impl implementation of the uh, bicycle, safe, uh, bicycle master plan, uh, and then soon the pedestrian uh, master plan that the count uh, that the planning uh, department is is working on currently. Uh, so there are a number of things that we need to do. We need to uh, build more crosswalks. We need to build more uh, protected bike lanes. Create buffers between cars um, and and uh, pedestrians and bicyclists. Um, and then uh, you know beyond all that, we need to slow cars down. We need to get from you know move from being auto centric and trying to move people as quickly as possible through an area uh, to safety first. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Anlu. Fatmana Berry, what agencies and organizations will you work with on issues like the lack of safe transportation and housing equity? You have 90 seconds. Yes, so definitely Department of Transportation, obviously, um, Department of Health and um, Housing. Um, one, because living here in East County, I know that many of these um, apartment buildings that we have here are unhealthy. We have apartments that have so much mold that you can smell it and taste it in the back of your throat and people are living in this. That needs to be addressed. I will want to work with grassroots organizations that deal specifically with um, um, proper and safe transportation. Um, I won't name names because I'm not working with them now and I've never gotten permission to speak on them. Um, but there are many grassroots organizations right now who are on the ground working on public transit. I will work to ensure that we have the bus rapid transit here in the East County. And it needs to have a dedicated lane. We do it in Virginia, we do it in DC. We can do it here in Montgomery County. I will work to make sure that we try to provide um, uh, walkable streets, um, provide proper bike lanes that are um, safe for our community. Make sure that we have, especially here, because I live right on um, off of Stewart Lane, and when you have to cross 29, it is the most dangerous thing that you could ever want to see. And provide a, a, a be better access point to go from my side of the street to go to where the police station is, make it safer for people to, um, to cross that street. 
And of course, make sure that um, folks can get from this side of the county to the other side of the county in less than in about 30 minutes. So thank you. Thank you, Ms. Barry. Christopher Bolton, what agencies and organizations will you work with on issues like the lack of safe transportation and housing equity? You have 90 seconds. Um, the first one I would work with um, for the transportation piece would be DOT. Um, I would like to see in high pedestrian areas, those areas designated as pedestrian safety areas. Um, so if you think about it, when you're driving on the beltway or you're driving anywhere near construction, the fines increase. And I think that areas where we have high pedestrian traffic, Blair High School, White Oak, Lockwood Drive in New Hampshire Avenue, um, 29 at Tech Road, Castle Boulevard, you have people doing 80, 90, 100 miles an hour through those areas where pedestrians walk. So I'd like to see the fines doubled, maybe even tripled. Um, you have people texting on their phones. So these are things that DOT can handle. I'd like to see more speed cameras set up along Route 29 and 650 to help mitigate those speeders. Um, as far as the housing piece, um, I'd like to see the DCHA to work with banks and take foreclosed homes and include that into a first buyer home, first time home buyers program. Give seed grant money to people and help people build equity. The problem right now is everybody's renting. And if people don't have homes to sell, then their retirement gets much tougher. So giving people the chance to build more equity. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bolton. Daniel Karoma, what agencies and organizations will you work with on issues like the lack of safe transportation and housing equity? You have 90 seconds. Uh, thank you, JJ, for the question. So I've spent over 15 years in the executive branch. So I've already worked with uh, the MCDOT, Montgomery County uh, Department of Transportation, um, DHCA, you know, the Department of Housing and Community Affairs. I, I work with them on a regular basis. But on transportation, there are three agencies that I will dedicate myself to advocate for East County. SHA is the number one of them, the State Highway Administration, because many of our major transportation is issues are on state highways, right? If we're talking about 29, right? Many of, I mean, I, was, I just witnessed a crash, uh, I think it was yesterday. And between Stewart Lane and 29, there has to be a new engineering pattern that is built there for, uh, for drivers, but also put a pedestrian crosswalk um, I, 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 after, I mean, to, so, so, so that seniors can cross off 29 to come to the White Oak Shopping Center. And on housing, obviously I would work with, as I say, the Department of Housing and Community Affairs, which I've worked with. I worked with them on their microloan program targeting low income residents who own businesses. But I'll also work with um, uh, HOC, Housing Opportunity Commission, and MHP. Why? Because this district is a majority priority African-American district. I would make sure that we create more pathways for home ownership for minority communities in this district. That is imperative. That is a, is a, is a, is a racial equity issue, is a social justice issue. And as a council member, I would make sure that is a priority. Thank you, Mr. Karoma. Carrie Lamari. Okay. These organizations will you work with on issues like the lack of safe transportation gotcha. and housing equity. You have 90 seconds. All right, real quick. Uh, I, I, my my uh, fellow candidates seem to confuse Department of Transportation with the State Highway Administration. Most of the major roads in, in the East County, Route 29, 198, University Boulevard, these are state roads. Um, so it would be the State Highway Administration would be the organization that I would work with. Uh, I'm, I'm hearing a lot of complaints um, that the improvements in, in recent years by State Highway uh, are problematic. Uh, for example, Burtonsville Crossing, uh, the, there's a concern that, you know, uh, people will use uh, the Burtonsville Crossing as a cut through, um, you know, on 29 heading to 198. So, uh, and then Stewart Lane, there, there are numerous areas where State Highway has to revisit and do and address uh, the issues. With respect to housing, I would work with uh, our numerous um, nonprofit organizations, housing advocates like Montgomery Housing Partnership, 
Uh, I have a vision of creating community land trust. My fear is the children in our counties are going to be doomed to being renters the rest of their life. With community land trust, trust, we'll give these young people the opportunity to buy the bricks and the sticks, not the land. That way they can build equity, they can get tax deductions, they have pride of ownership, yet they can save 25% in the cost of, of the purchase of a new home. I think that's the kind of endeavor, uh, kind of endeavor that we want to work towards. We want to give, give our kids an opportunity. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Lamari. Kristen Mink. What agencies and organizations will you work with on issues like the lack of safe transportation and housing equity? You have 90 seconds. Yeah, so of course we need to work with Montgomery County DOT as well as Shaw, the State Highway Administration as has been mentioned. Um, I think it's important also that we are coordinating with nonprofits and grassroots organizations who have been advocating for safer streets and for Vision Zero, like Action Committee for Transit, like um, Washington Area Bicycle Association, um, Montgomery County Families for Safe Streets, to name a few. So a lot of these advocates are folks who have been impacted by our failures, our Vision Zero failures, um, and they have uh, great data, great information, and they have been uh, working really hard to press us to do better. So what we need to do is to work with them and listen to them um, and be advocates at the state level to get things done on, on those state level roads. Um, we also need to work with the um, state legislature. There was a bill that just failed um, in the state Senate that would have required the state to budget a minimum amount to be spent on road safety and pedestrian safety. We really needed that to pass and it did not get passed. It got stopped in the Senate. So we need to uh, organize to make that happen um, in regards to housing, um, the HOC, Housing Opportunities Commission, um, the uh, DHCA, of course, we need to be working with those folks. I think that uh, social housing is gonna be part of the solution here, which HOC has been, has been a champion for. I think we also need to work closely with the Montgomery County Coalition for the Homeless. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Mink. William Montier, what agencies and organizations will you work with on issues like the lack of safe transportation and housing equity? You have yes, 90. Great, thank you, Judge. I would partner with transportation housing um, to, to and I would support, um, let me start that again. I would partner with transportation and housing. First, we have a lot of transportation issues already on the table, and I think we need to bring those to fruition. One of them is the BRT that goes down Route 29. Um, to make that a complete effort, we need to widen the street. We need to build a dedicated lane. That would make that a functional, more functional and more effective uh, mode of transportation just right there. In addition to that, we need to do what we can do, and it is affordable, expand our ride-on service throughout the county and all the way to Howard County. As to affordable housing, um, you know, we need to partner with nonprofit organizations and take advantage of their expertise. They've been looking at this for years. They've got a lot of data to, to, uh, to create sustainable, affordable housing solutions. I want to look to eliminate barriers to purchasing home, maybe even creative things like creating rent to own options. Um, in addition to that, uh, we've always got to have a public-private partnership with our developers, give them tax incentives to create affordable housing units and increase our moderately priced housing units. Um, you know, um, and also we have to enhance the down payment assistance program that we already have in Montgomery County. Um, we have to expand that. And even for teachers especially, I think we should make uh, part of their compensation package, uh, down payment assistance. Thank you, Mr. Montier. Jeremiah Pope, what agencies and organizations will you work with on issues like the lack of safe transportation and housing equity. You have 90 seconds. Uh, yes, um, <clears throat> obviously I work with the uh, uh, the uh, Maryland Department of Transportation and Montgomery County Department of Transportation, HOC, and the uh, Maryland Department of Housing. Um, and but I want to make you know quick note that I would also work with our community leaders um, and also our single family homeowners uh, because a lot of things that we're talking about is going to uh, hopefully. Uh, not change too much of the character of our neighborhoods. And so I wanna ensure that 
uh, when we're building this housing, that we have everybody in place to have a great conversation uh, before we move on, uh, move forward on different housing policies. Um, yes, we do need uh, middle missing housing. Uh, yes, the, um, the one good thing about Montgomery County, uh, we do have a lot of great groups and a lot of great organizations um, out there to help us um, um, do the right thing. But, you know, I'd like to be very clear that if, if we're going to do any of these things that our, our, our homeowners have a say in what um, goes into their community. Um, so I'll, I'll be clear that I will be working with the homeowners. I'll be working with each department, uh, but I want to make sure that um, any housing that we build in this community um, will be conducive uh, to the characteristics of our neighborhoods. Thank you. Can't hear you. I was saying I was working through a little bit of a technical issue. I knew that I had it. I was working through it. So oh, okay. Good Thank you, Mr. Pope. You, Kate Woody, what agencies and organizations will you work with on issues like the lack of safety with, let me start that again. What agencies and organizations will you work with on issues like the lack of safe transportation and housing equity? You have 90 seconds. I would work with the Department of Transportation for both Montgomery County and for the state. I would uh, work with the other entities, county and state and federal for uh, funding for better roads. For example, you go down 29 where you're near Trader Joe's just south of Lockwood Drive and you go across the bridge, there's no room to expand the, the roads and have a dedicated lane because it's already choked to full it as it is. I would work on crosswalks with better lighting and longer cross times because people are healthy people can barely get across these roads with a lot of time to move it. I would move for more paths for walking and because you can have baby carriages, you can have people elderly on walkers walking somewhere to a stores or the grocery stores. I would also work to work with the housing authorities in Montgomery County and in the different jurisdictions like Friends of White Oak is one of, an excellent one to refurbish the housing or give a forum for committees to refurbish the housing that's there without tearing it down because it's less expensive and it's more available now. I went for the uh, light rail, most of all. I have concerns about the BRT because I have read about accidents. Okay. On to our next question and back to the top, Brian and Lou. What? or rather, would you take immediate action, such as more renter protections, eviction moratoriums, and housing shortages? You have 90 seconds. Yeah, absolutely. I think we need to protect our renters. Um, you know, it's something that I've worked on quite a bit on over my career. Uh, before getting into the Park and Planning Commission and working there on housing issues, uh, I worked uh, with Council Member Hucker on a landlord protection bill. And uh, we actually did inspections of the Enclave apartments at the time. Um, and saw the mold and saw some of the issues that were happening in those apartments um, and helped pass legislation to prioritize the enforcement um, of uh, apartments and uh, uh, violations in those apartments um, that uh, are life and safety issues such as mold and lack of air conditioning and those kinds of things. So absolutely think we need to, to prioritize those issues. Um, I haven't seen a, a wave uh, of evictions, but I certainly think that the county should be doing more to uh, distribute the pandemic uh, uh, aid that it has for uh, for renters and those kinds of things. Um, and then to address our housing issues specifically, I think the biggest thing that we need to do is build more housing. Uh, we have a housing shortage uh, here in the county, we're projected to grow uh, by about 200,000 people over the next 20 to 30 years. 
Uh, we should be building about 4,000 units a year to meet that demand. Uh, we're not building anywhere near that. And so we need to prioritize housing, particularly along our uh, transit corridors, turning parking lots to places. Uh, for example, the uh, uh, White Oak Shopping Center, you know, that, that could be a successful mixed use development. Uh, Burtonsville Crossing uh, is another area where, where you could put uh, housing and make it a successful development. Um, so, you know, those are some of the things I'd like to do on that. Thank you, Mr. Anlu. Fatmana Berry, would you take immediate action such as more rental protections, eviction moratoriums, and housing shortages? Um, the answer is yes. Um, I'm not sure why we are taking away the protections for renters. There were issues before the pandemic, and the issues were exacerbated during the pandemic, and they've continued um, as we recover. Uh, so definitely, we should have rental protection we know that people in my district are shift workers, many of them, and they're making less than the $15 an hour minimum wage. And we know that minimum wage um, provides you only like $600 a week before taxes. So imagine what you, what you bring home. Um, so if you have to pay for rent, that's $1,500 a month, and you have kids, that is almost impossible to do without having protections from the county. And as far as making sure that uh, uh, we have safer apartment co um, complexes, people may have been fined, uh, these large corporations, but you have to hold them accountable. That means the fines should not be reduced to the bare minimum. Because if I'm making $100,000 in an apartment and I have a fine that's $1,000, I don't need to fix it. And so we need to make sure that they're held accountable refurbish our buildings and make them into housing and ensure that we have proper and safe and affordable housing for people who live on this part of the county. Ensuring that at the end of the day, when a person goes to um, buy a home, they can afford it because they're being paid a livable wage that is accessible to the people who live in the county. Thank you, Ms. Barry. Christopher Bolton. Would you take immediate action such as more rental protections, eviction moratoriums, and housing shortages? You have 90 seconds. So I think uh, rental protections are an excellent <clears throat> idea. I, I think the problem is, is when the pandemic happened, people didn't have to pay rent. And we stopped evicting people. And evictions kind of keep people sort of on the cusp of paying their rent. And the problem is, is that all these landlords got stuck with 20, 30 units not paying rent. And now they're raising their rent prices to kind of help re them recoup their money. So in East County, um, rental prices have gone up 25% over the past five years. Um, so we need to kind of get a handle on that, get people better jobs. As to safe housing, Right now there's a bill in the county. I sat there with Brian that day when we went to the enclave and we smelled it and we saw it and we were sickened. And part of that bill that got passed was that if your landlord doesn't fix something, you can withhold the rent and fix, fix it yourself. So I'd like to see that increased. I'd like to see landlords fined. And I'd like to see enforcement to say that if you're a landlord and you're under fines or you haven't paid your fines, you can't even think about building another development within Montgomery County until you catch up on your fines. The problem is, is that these big corporations have no incentive to follow the rules. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bolton. Daniel Coroma, would you take immediate action such as more renter protections, eviction moratoriums, and housing shortages? You have 90 seconds. JJ, absolutely. Um, but well, let me also say that we already have an office um, at the Department of Housing and Community Affairs called the Office of Landlord Tenant Affairs. And the, um, they're basically negotiating with landlords and tenants uh, and also applying the rental um, subsidies as well. So to an extent, not too long ago, they actually had volunteer attorneys who went to court, but many of the, um, cases we have in Montgomery County do not even go to court or you know, they don't even get to the eviction uh, place. But as we talk about I mean, rental safety and, and housing, it comes back to economic development as we started this conversation, right? 
we need to make sure that we grow the economy so that good paying jobs are here in the East County. Because when they are here in the East County, people will be able to afford the housing. There's no doubt. This, this pandemic, we had a recession in it. Just It wasn't as large as the uh, financial re recession where that's actually prompted me to start the Gilchrist Immigrant Resource Center in the East County so that people can be reskilled and get a job. This one did not, you know, did not require people to reskill. But we do need, again, uh, economic development because that will you know, give people the power within their hands to choose where they want to stay. And as a council member, I'll make sure not only um, we not only double down on Montgomery College because the, the Gilchrist Center is where the Montgomery College is right now in the East County. I'll make sure I do that as a council member. Thank you, Mr. Karoma. Kerry Lumari, would you take immediate action such as more renter protection, eviction moratorium, uh, eviction moratoriums, and on issues like housing shortages? Well, you everyone, have... everyone deserves to live in, in rodent-free, mold-free, rodent-free, safe housing. That's just a reality. Um, with respect to uh, eviction moratoriums, I, I agree with with uh, with Chris Bolton. The the fact of the matter is, we need more rental assistance programs. Uh, the the county didn't come up with the money during the uh, pandemic to pay uh, landlords when they needed it. It created a nightmare, and and the and who lost? The tenants lost. They're going to be paying. They're going to be in court. There's going to be many bankruptcies. There's going to be, uh, you know, foreclosures. This is going to last for for years to come as a result. We needed to have a uh, a pandemic uh, strategy uh, as it relates to housing. We didn't have one. We made it made it work, and I don't think we did a good job um, with respect to uh, uh, you know um, um, affordable housing. We need to provide it. Otherwise, what we're going to we're, we're going to do, do is doom the future of our children to becoming renters forever. Um, the Council of Governments has indicated that we're going to have 200,000 people coming to Montgomery County in the next 30 years. 75% of those people are going to be in need of affordable housing. We also have 30% of the population. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lamari. Kristen Mink. Would you take immediate action, such as more renter protections, eviction moratoriums, and on issues like housing shortages? You have 90 seconds. So I was an MCPS teacher, uh, and I taught for years, including in East County, and I saw firsthand the impact of housing instability on students. So yes, absolutely, this would be one of my top priorities coming into office. We had temporary rent stabilization legislation um, for part of the pandemic, it has now been allowed to expire and there were landlords who are waiting you know, for that expiration doing month to month leases so that they could then um, you know, take the opportunity to significantly raise rental costs. Um, this is a huge problem. I think we need rent stabilization countywide. We also have renters who are living in absolutely unacceptable conditions. I've knocked doors in White Oak um, to help organize tenant uni unions and uh, hear repeatedly from folks who have contacted the county for help and have not received that help. So there needs to be significantly more oversight and accountability. Um, we also have you know, young professionals going into heading into their prime earning years who are being forced to settle far from their Montgomery County jobs. And when I was you know, teaching in schools, many of my colleagues lived in Howard County. So you know, we're in addition to this being an, an equity issue, this being a transit and climate issue, um, this is also a situation where um, um, we, you know, we just need to, if we're going to hire these public employees, we need to make sure that they can live here. So we need significantly more affordable housing. We need to expand um, who that applies to. I think we should have a home buyer program for public employees, starting with our teachers and our school staff. We have seen this modeled in other places. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Mink. William Montier, would you take immediate action? such as more renter protection, eviction moratoriums, and on issues like housing shortages? 90 seconds to answer. Thank you, JJ. Absolutely. Renter protection is hugely important. A lot of renters that I talk to, it seems to me the number one issue for them is not knowing where to go for questions and answers to those questions. When they're not being treated fairly by their 
landlord, um, be it a large corporation or they're renting a townhouse, uh, a townhouse from an individual, um, they're being treated unfairly. And um, so expanding um, eviction moratoriums, I think that would be huge, even in, even in light of the fact the pandemic has, the tide has stemmed in that regard. Um, but as always, the biggest thing we can do is economic development. We need more high paying jobs in this area and that's gonna be the great equalizer. Um, in addition to that, we have got to deal with the housing shortage in our county. Um, that will help put prices in place. It may not reduce them, but can, do, can attack the rate at which they increase. And as a county, we need to look at how can we be competitive with Howard County and Prince George's County in the housing market? Because we're losing people to those areas. So um, that, that includes public servants, housing allowances, anybody who works for the county, anybody who works for the school system, police officers, um, teachers, of course, um, and the staff that supports teachers, bus drivers and uh, cafeteria workers, they need to have help in affordable housing. And that is another one of the wealth. Thank you, Mr. Montier. Jeremiah Pope, would you take immediate action such as more renter protection, eviction moratoriums, and on issues like housing shortages? You have 90 seconds. Yeah, thank you for the question. You know, as I uh, listen to everybody's uh, comments and uh, suggestions, I, you know, I, um, I do believe that we do need uh, rental protections, um, but I also believe there's a balancing point. Um, you know, you have, um, you know, small landlord owners and who, who uh, feel the need that they cannot um, get a person out their place. The, the person is, is not paying rent um, due to the fact they know somebody else will pay it. And so I'm, I'm a little nervous about that as well, is that I want to ensure that people are not taking advantage of the system. And then also if we set in these, set in these type of policies, uh, then it's a balanced approach. I mean, because what we don't want to do is get to the point where we start um, um, put so many regulations on the apartment complexes and, and, and landlords that they no longer want to build in the county uh, because it's a business and they can't make any money. Uh, but I will agree that um, you know, people do need to live in safe environments. People need to uh, feel comfortable because you're paying a lot and you are, and it's a, it's a responsibility of the landlord to ensure that you're safe. Um, so, you know, I, I think we have to have a balanced approach to this. If we're going to begin to start to cap rent, uh, then we need to, to ensure that uh, the people who own the facilities are able to still pay uh, the property taxes because it, it's, you know, the, the people who live there pays in to the landlord and they need the money to make their mortgage as well. And so I wanna make sure, um, you know, we protect both sides. That's, that's fair and that's equitable. Thank you, Mr. Pope. Thank Kate you. Woody, would you take immediate <laughs> actions such as more renter protections, eviction moratoriums, and on issues like housing shortages? You have 90 seconds. I would have inspections of the house at uh, fairly frequent times and follow through on that with fines for not uh, cleaning up the property and taking care of vermin that's, that are in there. Uh, what I might say is I lived in New York City, and, which has had rent control for at least 100 years. And what people do is they take the house, the, the apartment, and they will it to their children and they never leave and therefore a lot of new properties will have will put grow up in let's say the west side so i would be worried about completely rent control i would worry about a complete protection against uh, evictions right now as far as rent control the rent was limited at 0.4 of 1% and now it's 1.4%. And 20 years ago, it was 5% was the maximum that it could be raised. I feel that the housing should be cleaned up and that there should be financing and seed money for refurbishing properties and even allowing some kind of uh, condominium approach so that each person can get seed money for refurbishing their own apartment at themselves. We also have the Office of Landlord Tenant Affairs. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Kate Woody. Last question. Um, we're short on time, 
What I'm going to let you go ahead and answer this. Back to the top, Brian Anlu. If elected on day one, what would be your first action? 90 seconds, please. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so I think the first thing I'd do is uh, having talked a lot about economic development um, and spurring job creation here in the county is um, getting uh, Burtonsville moving forward. As I said at the beginning, I moved there for about 10 years. I've done a lot of work on the Burtonsville crossing uh, issue. Uh, one of the things that uh, is stopping that project from moving forward is covenants that, um, you know, unfortunately can't be extinguished unless the uh, parties that uh, own those covenants agree to extinguish them. Um, so I'd work with the county executive and the leg and the executive branch to uh, pass what's called a tax increment financing plan uh, to allow for the uh, construction of a garage um, on the, on the uh, uh, park and ride lot there behind Burtonsville Crossing that would help unlock some of the redevelopment potential of both the park and ride lot um, and the uh, and the adjacent uh, Burnsville Crossing Shopping Center. Uh, TIFs, they've been used successfully in other parts of the county like Silver Spring, uh, you know, to, to build garages and other things there that help spur yeah, economic development and help make Silver Spring what it is today. So, um, you know, creating that economic development, that redevelopment, bringing uh, much needed housing um, and cleaning up just an eyesore where people currently today uh, are doing burnouts uh, and speeding on 198 and those kinds of things. So I think it addresses a lot of the issues that we talked about here today. So that's probably my my first uh, action. And I'll just say it's uh, it's really hard going first. Uh, you know, my opponents have uh, the benefit of uh, of going uh, last, so they get to think about this a little bit more. So I hope you'll be uh, you'll take that into consideration. Thank you. Well, you did it, and um, we thank you for going first, Fatma Fatma Berry. If elected on day one, what would be your first action after taking office? You have ninety seconds. Thank you. Um, so as many may know, um, District 5 um, has the highest percentage of Black residents in the county than any other district. Um, and when you add the Brown residents, we have about 57.6%. So in this district, historically speaking, we have received some of the least amount of resources than any other part of this county. And on day one, I would want us to be honest, have us speak truth to power and make sure that this district is amplified and the, the resources that we have been missing are brought to the table, whether it is providing the proper resources for our schools. We have schools like Brunswick Elementary School where you had no heat in at least three of the classrooms. You had a situation where when I found out, I went there with, uh, 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 with someone from, from my camp to go live on Facebook to show the gravel where kids are, are, are walking to get to, um, to the school to show the, the, the dangers of cars going in there, brought the parents from the Parents Teachers um, Association onto a live show to ensure that we speak it to the fact that the school is not receiving the proper resources. One of the first things I wanna be able to do is bring that to the forefront, ensure that we talk about providing livable wage for our community. Yes, I know some people say it's hard because we just had minimum wage, but minimum wage of $15 is not livable. And those are the things that I would love to be able to address the first time in office. Thank you. Ms. Barry, thank you very much. Christopher Bolton, if elected on day one, what would be your first action after taking office? 90 seconds to answer. Uh, kissing my wife, <clears throat> that'd probably be my first action. And then uh, go show my kids my new office. And then I would get in my car and go to Edison Park Drive. And for those of you who do not know, Edison Park Drive is Montgomery County Police Headquarters. And I would probably take up a meeting with Chief Jones for a few hours to see how we can kind of get this public safety issue under wraps, how we can kind of keep our officers in 3D. Um, the problem we're having now with 3D is they get such a variety of calls that when it comes time to take the promotion test, they get promoted and sent to other districts. So they don't actually leave the county as much. The transfer out of 3D versus the resignation rate the transfer out rate is much higher than the resignation rate. So I would go there and square it up. Then I would drive over to 45 Goody Drive to MCPS, to their headquarters and meet with the educational leaders over there, Dr. McKnight, and sort of ask how can we improve after school things to kind of keep our kids off the street. If we keep our kids off the street, they're involved in programs, whether it be education, mentoring, 
just stuff to keep them off the streets. I think it keeps them out of Edison Park Drive. And I'll keep my answer short. And Brian, I appreciate that you're going first. You can always change your last name to Zanalu, so that way you go last. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Bolton. Daniel Karoma, if elected on day one, what would be your first action after taking off? 90 oh. seconds. JJ, thank you so much. Um, I'll do what I've always done for the past 15 years in Montgomery County, uh, do community engagement meetings. I'll do one at Leisure Walk. I'll do one at Bottonsville. In fact, I would name it your vision for Council District 5. Many times policymakers are making policies without listening to the people. So I want to make sure that all those department heads will come to the East County. They would see some people walk in, this, in some parts of the county, they don't even know where the East County is. So I'll make sure we bring, if you would like to um, engage in East County, you need to come to East County and meet the residents so that we can develop the vision together. JJ, I am, I will be a consensus council member. I mean, there's so many fighting that, I, that that's why businesses, again, talking about economic development, they want the council to be the convener so that they can discuss economic development. I'll be that council member. And again, let me close by saying it's been uh, an, an amazing opportunity uh, for me not only to be a public servant here in Montgomery County, but as I fought for the early voting site uh, to keep it the only one we have in the East County at Prisoner. And I became the lead champion for the one in White Oak. I hope we all, including the candidates, will promote the early voting site in White Oak so that we don't lose it. We fought so hard for that site. And if we don't promote it, if we don't get people to, um, to use it, we'll lose it. Thank you, Mr. Karoma. Carrie Lamari, question. What would you do on your first day after being elected, after taking office? You have 90 seconds. You know, there are so many significant challenges that we're facing today. Public safety is, is huge. But I think the most critical issue we have today is jobs. So what I would probably do is I'd bring the stakeholders together for Viva White Oak. I'd want to bring the, the, uh, the Montgomery County delegation, the developer. I'd like to bring the community. I'd like to have a, a sit down, try to build consensus on where we need to go, how we need to get there, where we're going to get some seed money and make this happen. The reality is uh, across this county, our job rate has gone down. And along with that job rate, our quality of life, uh, life has gone down. This may be leading into our uh, part of our public safety issues. If people don't have jobs, they're challenged with, with meeting those significant expenses. The reality is I, I would bring those stakeholders together and I would try to get that ball rolling, whatever it takes. I'd wanna know what infrastructure is needed. I would want, want to know, you know, what, uh, you know, tax abatements are needed, uh, what seed money is needed to get, to get these uh, employers to come to Montgomery County, and I'd want to get Viva White Oak started as soon as possible. That's what I would be doing. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Lamari. Kristen Mink, if elected, on day one, what would be your first action after taking office? 90 seconds. So for years, East County has been, um, neglected, underinvested in. Uh, consistently, I hear from residents and having seen it myself firsthand, um, I know it's true that um, repeatedly there have been demands made by residents of East County that have gone unanswered. So the very first thing that I'm gonna do is organize. And I've actually already started doing that, but sure, we'll say, we'll say the first day. That's organizing with um, grassroots advocacy groups, with neighborhood associations, with HOAs, with PTAs. That means calling them up making personal contact, getting our priorities aligned and preparing to strategize, to push other council members to pass the initiatives that we need here in East County. I'll give you an example of why this is so important and how this works. Burnsville Elementary School was promised uh, an addition, was promised investment a decade ago. They have not gotten it, it continued to be delayed. I have been uh, working with parents in the PTA there 
Um, we put together a, a little campaign. I put together a click to email tool based on messaging that I made sure I ran by them. I brought my volunteers up to Burtonsville. We flyered houses all over Burtonsville to let them know they were delaying investment yet again. This generated almost 600 emails to our local legislators and to MCPS. It generated calls and all of a sudden the principal and the PTA started getting calls and emails um, from local legislators saying, what's going on? Everybody calm down. And uh, lo and behold, we got a letter from uh, Senator Zucker and the D14 delegation that they had found $150,000 for Burtonsville Elementary School. Thank you, Ms. Mink. William Montier, if elected on day one, what would be your first action after taking office? You have 90 yeah. seconds. Thank you, JJ. My first action day one in office would be to go and meet with the County Chamber of Commerce, meet with all the businesses in our county. Um, I believe in evidence-based policy and I would wanna know from businesses that are already doing it, why can't we attract more businesses? How are you successful? What incentive programs can we have to um, help you expand your business and create more jobs? And I would do that at every level. Um, that's the number one thing because as it was said before, that drives all these things. We know we have a shortage of teachers. I sat at the town hall meeting at the Board of Education and sat right next to and talked with for two hours, the um, uh, president of the Teachers Association for Montgomery County. And she said, at the end of the year, we're gonna lose a lot of teachers. They're gonna quit all the new ones. I said, why? She said, well, because they're overworked and they're too constricted by the number of standardized tests that we have to take. So they can't teach and use their natural gift to help students reach the highest potential. So in order to hire more teachers, in order to hire more police officers, um, we need a higher tax base, we need higher paying jobs. And so the number one thing I would do is meet with these business owners, meet with the Chamber of Commerce and find out from them the best plan to make this county thrive economically and build high paying jobs. Thank you, Mr. Montier. Jeremiah Pope, if elected on day one, what will be your first action after taking off? 90 seconds. Yes. Um, my whole campaign has been about listening and, and leading. Um, so the first thing I'll do on day one is go back into the community uh, with the binder I've been keeping from the doors, I've, uh, from the thousands of doors I've been knocking off and bringing in people to the room so they can have a seat at the table with me. Uh, because I think a lot of this is about making sure that everybody has a voice. Uh, so I'm focusing on education, making sure our teachers are able to feel safe in the schools, but also making sure that they are paid fair. Also talking about public safety, making sure our officers have resources that they need in order to, to do their jobs. I wanna make sure everybody has a seat at the table. And I also wanna talk about the environment. I wanna make sure that the stakeholders um, who are concerned as much as I am for the environment has a seat at the table. So when we're talking about building things out, I wanna make sure it, it, does, it protects our environment uh, because that's important. And so that's the, th that's the first thing I would do on day one is making sure that I bring the people um, to the room, to the office, because this is not uh, District 5's office. This is everybody's office in District 5. And so everybody's name needs to be on the door. And that's what it's gonna be about. That's the type of leadership that I'm gonna bring because I'm gonna listen and then I'm gonna lead. So therefore I can deliver. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Pope. Kate Woody, last question. It is, if elected on day one, what will be your first action after taking office? 90 seconds, please. My first action will be to apply for the portion of the $195 million for the particularly the $47 million that has been set aside for small and disadvantaged businesses to have them brought to this county so that we can make seed money and micro loans for businesses in within the next six months over the winter, have small kiosks, start training sessions in, in internships so people can learn how to run a business and lose maybe a several thousand dollars instead of several hundred thousand dollars. I would also hold an open house for all my constituencies and services who are in interface with the county, such as the police, the school system. And I would ask, get their input of what they need. For third, I would work for an anchor. And that anchor in my now, 
my mind is NASA, the National Association of Space Agency, Aeronautic Space Agency, which would be close so that we could have high tech businesses with an organization that's already here and make jobs. Fourth, I would keep first and foremost in my mind and my message to my constituents is that I as a council member work for the public, for my constituents, not they serve me. Thank you. Hey, Woody, thank you. Thank you all, all of you. This has been a great opportunity I want to thank the Friends of White Oak for, first of all, asking me to do this and their efforts to improve White Oak and connect with the community and residents about their needs and how the area can be transformed for everyone. Be sure to go to their website at www.friendsofwhiteoak.org. This recording will be on there soon. I also want to thank them for coming up with this list of questions, pulling all the panelists together and everything that was involved in this process and Montgomery County Media at www.mymcmedia.org. Thank you all, and good night.